Hello everybody! Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for yet uh, joining us for yet another exciting episode of Node 2020 Extended. I am joined once again by, with my wonderful, wonderful co-host Nathan Smith of the Kansas City Database Meetup Group, Graph Database Meetup Group. And we are also joined by Shilpa and Julian. So I guess quickly I'm going to hand over to you. Nathan, how have you been doing? Very well, and it's so exciting to be involved with this session today. I think we've got wonderful topics to think about. You know, we think about the technology all the time, but I think we're bringing the human side of it in with both of these speakers today. So we're really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've got two super, super, uh, they've all been super, super exciting, but we have <laughs> two more super, super exciting talks to look forward to. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, where you all are. No, yes, sorry, um, George, we, we had a few technical issues, so we're running a little bit late, but hopefully we're all good now. Uh, as usual, we're going to start off uh, with the first two talks. So Julian's going to start followed by a Shilpa. And then afterwards, we will have a panel conversation. So put your questions in the chat. We will pick those up and we'll go through them at the end. So without further ado, uh, Julian, over to you. Well, good morning or afternoon, wherever it's uh, morning for me. I'm Dr. Julian Gomez. I've been working in computer graphics for quite a few decades and knowledge management for a few decades. My focus is on interdisciplinary research and development. And I've done both of those uh, research into computer animation, uh, computer systems, and also into IT systems and knowledge management and semantic webs. So most recently I've been focused on, as I said, interdisciplinary applications. And today's talk is about one specific one, which is treating history as a graph database. Now at this point I switch to keynote, all right. Do I have my title screen up? Looks good. Okay. So let me start off by uh, explaining how this came about. It, I started my career at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the Computer Graphics Laboratory. And uh, okay, now the mouse isn't working. This was uh, located in Pasadena, California. And despite the name, there weren't any jets anywhere. That's a different story that I can tell somewhere else. Um, um, the lab was one of the starting points for 3D advanced 3D computer graphics. And a few years ago, I was wondering, we should tell the story about how all of this came about. And as I looked more and more at the history and how you tell the history, it hit me that history is a graph. We couldn't just say, well, this happened then and this happened then as history is conventionally presented. Now, really, history is things all over the place that are connecting all over the place. And when you assemble all of those, you get history. And it's conventionally presented as a book in a serial way. But as I said, it's not. It's a graph. <clears throat> so given that history is things all over the place being connected, how do you tell the story? One of the examples I like to cite is James Burke. The book came out in the 70s and then this, the BBC series out in the 80s. Did a wonderful job of explaining how this little thing here led to that little thing there, which led to a bigger thing way over there. And eventually, some time later, you end up with what you call history. When you tell a story, I was falling back mostly on how journalism does it. You may have gotten this in school, the five W's. Uh, as I talked more and more with the people who are responsible for telling the history, they kept saying that this is a good model to work with. Although I feel that there should be a how, because you talked about the faith, these, they don't really tell you how, that sort of gets lost in the wayside. So I like to say it's five W's and an H, but the H is silent. Now, given that history is things all over the place, as I said, a graph, how do we model this? Uh, well, I don't know, this is an issue because sure we're used to Neo4j and we're used to building graphs and queries, but when those those are for more conventional activities like you know numbers and strings and then trying to do thread analysis, but how would you tell use it 
Neo4j to make a graph that's talking about history. It's a sort of different thing. Well, I don't have an answer. The quest, the point of today is to get you to think about how you would do it. How do you represent history? And how do you do a build a data model that lets you learn what the history is or continue defining the history as you learn more and more and able to incorporate it? <clears throat> What's definitely clear is about relationships. History as you learn it's, more and more. When we talk about history as a graph, then that means that we are talking about the assemblage of the, all of the nodes and the arcs in that graph in order to create this thing that we call history. So I, having done it, I mean, how, how do you go? Well, once again, John Muir, somebody I like to cite, and uh, a, few, a few years ago, I started working on this problem then, uh, specifically working on the NASA Computer Graphics Laboratory. So one of the things I like to mention is that, uh, quoting John Muir, this is literally dealing with the universe. So now as I move into details, I'll talk about three projects briefly. Uh, the Computer Graphics Lab is the first one I mentioned. In the mid-90s, Lego, the toy brick company, decided that they needed to be digital for lots of marketing reasons. And they understood that computer games and video games were up and coming and stealing market. Thing is, when you talk about going digital, just, just what does that mean? The, the focus for Lego Digital was building this L3D database, which was all of Lego's bricks and kits. And from that database, all of the business activities would derive. However, the database was 3D data. Uh, so that means 3D of a brick, 3D of a kit, and 3D computer graphics of bricks coming together. So I'll talk about this a bit more in a moment. Uh, the third one is a current, also a current activity, which is SIGGRAPH part of the Association for Computing Machinery. And the SIGGRAPH covers uh, 3D, well, all computer graphics, and is almost 50 years old. But if we build a knowledge base, we need to address the next 50 years too. And quite frankly, I don't think that you're gonna build a future technology with this 20th century technology. So it's somewhat uh, biased there. <clears throat> This is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It's in Pasadena, California. It is literally at the base of the mountains. This shot is the NASA's standard PR shot of the base. So what was so special about the computer graphics lab? Well, NASA conventionally did their visualizations using trained artists, uh, people who specialized in astronomy, astronautics, uh, aerospace, and they would make, if the visualization was needed, then they would create it using conventional graphics. When the computer graphics lab was established, then that was the first time NASA acknowledged that there could be a digital replacement. And this is uh, late 70s that we're, we're talking about. The lab ran from the late 70s to the late 80s. So more than that, besides using gra computer graphics as a visualization method, NASA actually released it. So when, when you see those movies of like Voyager flying by Jupiter or Pioneer flying by Saturn, our lab did those movies the big switch for NASA was that they were actually using those instead of animations prepared in conventional methods. By adopting this, we use a, uh, computer graphics for many other projects at JPL. And then eventually this led to the basis that computer graphics could be used for scientific visualization. So this is getting away from plotting packages, which were the conventional methods at the time. So this was what made the lab so important was that the graphics was doing a, a certainly a good enough job such that NASA could rely on it as a standard mode of operations. And this was the big issue for why the computer graphics lab was such an important part of computer graphics history. Well, having been such an important part of computer graphics history, then this led to needing to tell this that history, which is where I came in a few years ago. Uh, oh, my role at the lab, I was the engineer who was um, in the lab. There, was, there were four people, and uh, we had Dr. Jim Blinn, who was this principal scientist. I was the principal engineer. We had a systems guy and then our lab manager. <clears throat> I started working out um, actually with a product called The Brain, which is kind of like a baby graph database, and analyzing based on the, what I was talking about a few minutes ago about the five Ws and the silent H. It's like, how do we arrange nominally what is going on in order to tell the history of the graphics lab. 
And I say nominally because if you think of a graph, it doesn't have a starting point like a tree does, right? You can start anywhere. So in the brain, you have to identify some kind of starting point, which is the history of the lab. And then based on that, what were the, the different aspects of it? So I might say, well, what were the projects we've worked on? Hello, who's, I don't have a mouse. Well, um, some projects obviously would have been space missions, right? Like Voyager. Other projects would have been, uh, we actually did uh, the, the floor, the sea floor of Monterey Bay in California as 3D computer graphics. So projects could be space or whatever else was coming along, even the airplane visualization for the Air Force. But it was more than that. There was stories, things that happened. And uh, the, web, the website I indicated at the start of the presentation is one where you can find some of these stories. So, so the point here, you notice that the headings of the or the categories that are shown here on the screen are not necessarily convinced uh, directly related to the five W's, but rather that they are starting points for telling the stories, which are based on using the five W's as a, a coherent way of telling the stories. Okay, move forward a few years to mid nineties when Lego wanted to get digital. Uh, building the L3D database presented a problem because you don't put three, well, you don't put 3D graphics in the database. So this required a lot of develop R&D in order to make it happen. L3D was a centralized repository, as it says. And the idea was, well, suppose you want to make a Lego movie, then you would go and get the 3D definitions of the bricks and the, the kits and make the movie. If you wanted to do uh, PR shoots, you could do it with the physical bricks or create images with using 3D computer graphics software. Or you could make virtual reality games or other computer games. Uh, the core thing was that there's, if you talk about a Lego brick, there's only one. It comes in different colors, but there's a two by four brick or a two, two by two brick. But there should always be the central reference where you go to get that 3D CAD data. Uh, also, being a hub, the uh, intent, it wasn't actually technically possible in the 90s, but the intent was that kids could play with each other around the world using Lego servers in Denmark as the way in, in, uh, to handle the interaction between them. To build this database, I used Elastro, which became Informix, which then disappeared into IBM some years later. The key was that it was an object relational database. So this allowed me to have a, an object front end. And then this way I could have 3D graphics and Lego as data primitives for the client development. In the back end, uh, it was actually a relational database. But in the middle were these things they called data blades, which knew how to take the object data and convert it into um, entities that could go into the relational table. Uh, a couple of things I can tell you first off is that relation databases and 3D graphics do not get along. Databases are, well, relation databases are built for things like numbers and strings and blobs. And uh, it, it took you know, some convincing to, to make it happen. This is where the data blades came in. Correspondingly, the, the Lego is not something that goes into a database, but again, with data blades, we're able to, to manage that. There's in separate presentations, I talk about the technical issues in making this happen. The summary is that Lego had realized, as I said, that in the 90s, they needed to address the concept of Lego digital because going forward, it was going to be a major part. At one point, the owner of Lego said that he expected their digital business to be 20% of uh, company operations within 10 years. Um, I don't actually know if that's true, but he, it's certainly that they recognized the fact that digital and 3D computer graphics were going to be part of their future. So again, using the brain, I was looking at uh, what kinds of what kinds of categories do we need in order to tell the story. Uh, you notice that the categories are quite different than JPL, and the, one of the summary points. This will come up in one of the summary points later. Some things there are some things in common, like there were people involved and there were stories to tell. Uh, but you can see here, for example, if you're wondering why it says Pizza 4D. Well, as it turned out, that was one of the restaurants in Billund, Denmark, uh, where people congregated. And a lot of creative work and design work got done there. Sort of like the predecessor to going to the cafe to, or here in Silicon Valley, I think probably worldwide, people go to cafes and 
do all their work, their coding, their design work. Uh, back in the 90s, there, there weren't internet cafes, so we went to the pizza player. This is an essential part of the story of Lego Digital because of that. And in fact, it's even safe to say that without Pizza 4D, Lego Digital might not have existed. Obviously, this is something that needs to go into the history. Again, not exactly related to the five W's. It's that these categories that are presented here, as you start assembling them, it use the five W's as a basis for telling stories. And when you tell the stories, you told the history. <clears throat> At some point I'd, and during the abstract, I'd mentioned some of the intangible things that have to go into a database. And this is another big aspect as to why it's not just another IT problem. The charter from the owner of Lego was not just to do CAD models on a screen, but to do digital Lego. And Lego has an essence, you could call it an essence, but it, it's a feel. It's when you play with Lego, there's a lot of things going on it's besides the fact that you... you're moving pieces of plastic around. And the owner of Lego wanted this to transfer into the digital domain. Now, this is a big part is that Lego isn't just plastic bricks. If you ever hang around the company or end up working there, you realize that Lego has a long history and the way that they approach building a product for the world's children is more than just putting plastic into a mold and then putting those bricks into boxes and shipping them. Those are parts of the intangibles. Another part is something called Gantlov, which was Danish, translates literally as people law. In America, we, I would uh, encapsulate as saying that nobody's better than anybody else. So how do the L3D database had to embody some of this idea of first off that Lego is not just plastic bricks, but has a sense to it. And second, how do we implement this idea that, okay, you've got digital Lego, but that doesn't make you better than anybody else. So how do you put stuff like that into a database? One example would be gravity. If you hold a physical Lego brick and let go, it'll fall on the floor and immediately scurry under the couch. Uh, I don't know if anybody realized that Legos grow legs when you drop them. That's why you can never find them. Um, so what is, how is this an intangible? Because gravity is in a sense quite tangible. Well, in the digital world, if you let go of a virtual Lego brick, it just hangs there in space. So we could implement gravity, but back in the 90s, CPUs weren't really powerful enough to do that for hundreds of bricks at a time. It just uh, chunk the update rate to a, a real crawl. However, it was quite a differentiator. So somebody who had a computer was actually, were they better off, were they worse off than somebody who had physical Lego? In either case, it had to be addressed because there is the essence of playing with Lego being more than just moving bricks. And second is that we don't want anybody to be better than anybody else. And if you've got one thing and somebody else doesn't have that one thing, you don't want them to feel like, oh, I'm really, really missing out or uh, I'm really, really better than that person over there. So in order to build the database, then we had to put in concepts like whether gravity was applicable or not as you build a brick. And obviously this is some a set of attributes on a particular brick or a model. So this was one way of implementing this particular intangible. There were many others, which would be the subject of part of a different presentation. Okay, third project, uh, ACM SIGGRAPH. It's, uh, SIGGRAPH means Special Interest Group for Computer Graphics. So as I said, approaching its 50th birthday in the year 2023, and the question is, how do we tell that history? And this one is even more fun because it goes back to, you know, you could say dark ages of IT. There have been databases over the years, but there's no coordination between them. And uh, there's an acknowledgement that just museum pieces don't do it. I mean, this is a computing, a professional computing organization that needs to have a digital existence. Furthermore, whatever digital existence is created now needs to be able to address what's going to happen in the future. And in my view, it, we don't just want a database, we want a knowledge base. So we're talking a more sophisticated technology. <clears throat> further and even furthermore to that is that this is about computer graphics. We can't have a system where your input to it is try typing in a bunch of text and trying to get results that way. The knowledge base needs to support ideas of 
inputting or defining queries which go above typing in text or even basic visual mechanisms like point and click it needs to be far more sophisticated. At this point, you should be thinking um, Minority Report, where Tom Cruise is waving his hands around in the air, and think of those as being as defining queries, waving his hands around as defining queries. The thing is, the technology has now reached the point where sensing something like waving your hands around in the air is dirt cheap. So there's no reason to avoid it anymore. <laughs> Another fun part of building this knowledge base is that the tech is changing. So if we think about, say, where augmented reality was 10 years ago, and the fact that if we build a database today, it's got to be a significant part of the design and production effort. And in 10 years, who knows what's going to be coming along? And we're trying to build a knowledge base which addresses all of these. Uh, so it's like the rug is being shaken around while you're trying to stand on it. So quickly, uh, Part of the, the fun parts uh, of computer graphics history is that since it's grown up over the years, it's there's this one, this one. Th this is an example data model for one year of the annual conference. As it turns out, the data model is different for each year of the conference. Uh, so that's one of the fun parts. Um, this I forget which year I was working on, but I can tell you it doesn't work for the year before nor the, the year afterwards. Now I was talking about how to both uh, how to define queries, and this also comes back in, into how do you look at your results. And again, it needs to be more than just text. So I want to show you a short, a few short clips here from a, a part of the visualization system for the Stigraph history. And these are movies because I don't want to chance that uh, the server would misbehave while I was trying to do this demonstration. So I made some movies ahead of time. Think, keep in mind that these are actual live queries. So this first one, if we take a SIGGRAPH conference and we were wondering, okay, well, what are the papers that were presented? So in this case, the yellow spheres are people and the, the sorry, the blue spheres are people, the yellow spheres are papers that were published at this particular conference that's being queried. And as, as you could see, the, you're able to interact with it in 3D. This is on a flat screen. Uh, you are also able to interact with this in VR or AR. That's quite a different experience and it's impossible to present that on a flat screen. It has to be something you go do. Uh, th this one was a very basic query and just authors and papers. Well, SIGGRAPH has a lot of art to it, art using com computers to create art or, or whatever. But the part of the conference is an actual art show. So the next question was, okay, what about this particular artist named Copper Gillick, what uh, presentations has she had in the SIGGRAPH art shows? And it came out as a blob, which is not really useful to work with. So I ran a relaxation algorithm over that. Now it's somewhat easier to see. The blue person is the artist named Copper Gillick and the cyan colored spheres are particular artworks that she's published at SIGGRAPH. So this led to another query is like, well, what about people who have both published papers and artworks at SIGGRAPH conference? And so that led to this query. Again, it's a blob. So once again, that you can interact with in 3D. So I run the relaxation algorithm again, and now things straighten out. And we have blue spheres, which are people. In this case, it's Dr. Blim, and he has published papers at SIGGRAPH and artworks at SIGGRAPH. The other blue sphere is Dr. L.D. Smith, who has done artwork and papers at SIGGRAPH. This, as you saw, you can interact with this in 3D and you're able to, uh, to move things around to try and get a better idea of what the structure looks like in 3D. This is actually a test bed um, for trying kind of different kinds of algorithms to input and visualize the database. Uh, and it goes back to using computer graphics to explain computer graphics, which is a good thing. By the way, uh, I have the design talent of an average rock, so that's why the graphics on this are so unspectacular. One thing to keep in mind is that what I showed you, as I said, were pre canned movies, but all of this stuff is live queries into Neo4j. Off on the right, you can enter a query uh, or you can you can interact with things and this hits Neo4j and it comes back with a new 3D presentation. Okay, some summary points about working on this. Uh, 
it's just every, every project of the three projects I'm working on, each one has a completely different set of, of what is what are you going to address? Not just how you're going to address it. The graph database makes the how so much easier, but what has to be addressed. Of course, many elements in common. History is about people and places and times and things, the stuff that happened, that's going to be in common. But an example of items that are not in common, it, it, at JPL, they had back then a matrix organization where, yeah, there was an administrative structure like you have with a typical big institution, but there was also a project structure. And one of the space missions would take people from the different sections of the administrative section as needed. So I was in the computing section, but I might be spending my days with the mission design uh, mathematicians. And then we would both go and take a hike down to one of the spacecraft operations facilities. So it, it cut across the administrative structure. Uh, working on Lego was, uh, you could not, it was, Danish culture was just part of Lego. It's the daily life of Lego. And I mentioned earlier in the presentation about Yantala. Well, this is a Danish culture and government thing. It's, it's not part of the business, but we had to operate Lego digital uh, according to those laws. And of course, that has no meaning in the other two history projects I'm working on. Another observation is it cuts across domain. You know, in the Neo4j world, we're used to IT and KM, but as you saw, this involves a lot of computer graphics. In fact, all three of these projects are focused around different uh, uses of 3D computer graphics. So this is something to start with from day one, is that you are going to be crossing disciplines. As an example, uh, for working on the history projects, I'm finding I have to go to library science a lot because they have addressed some of these issues in the last Oh, when was the Library of Alexander? Like 3,000 years ago. So they, some of these, they've already got set, but they're doing it in their context. So we need to take what their knowledge and move it over into another context, which is 3D graphics. And then how do you collect and display and exhibit and make sense of all of these things out of history? Well, that's museums. So th this is just a starting list. Some of the big problems you run into, rapid data model changes, and I'm going to be emphasizing this a lot. This, as you do work on a project and you find out that, well, it needs to be adjusted, that's pretty much a daily event. Uh, hmm, not much comment here. This is just a, a truism. Building the SIGGRAPH database and running into all kinds of different data sources because different people have kept their databases differently and they refer to things in a different way. When I started working on the Lego database, I found 255 different databases within corporate headquarters and an inconsistent use of even the same word. Like you'll hear about the word Lego element, it meant different things in different departments. Going into history, there's lots and lots of non-digital data and especially in computer graphics because so many things have been manifested at the conferences as items and even in the early days, there weren't even CAD descriptions of the items. And then, as I said, data models that evolved, such as the data model for any year's conference being different from other years. So if you decide to take on one of these, uh, again, I'm really stressing the rapid data model changes. The last time I had to change the SIGGRAPH data model was Friday. And you know how much fun it is to do a data model change in an RDB, you have to, you know, add columns and change the schema and all that, and then uh, change all your clients and migrate the data model. And I think probably everybody's found doing something like this in Neo4j is just a lot, lot easier. As you do your data model, remember time is just a critical part of the data. If you think about a relationship such as person A is employed at company B, well, that existed over a particular time. So that relationship only is true over a certain time range. And it can happen again. Person A might've worked at company B two different times. In this case, obviously the differentiated by the time range. So again, an essential part of your data definition. Uh, SIGGRAPH is primarily an academic organization. If we talk about a particular professor who's at a particular university B, at the same time, they might also be a professor at university C. So this attribute of 
professor who's working at a university has a greater than one multiplicity. And if you are trying to do queries, one thing to keep in mind is temporal logic, because uh, this is a fee, it's sort of related to propositional calculus, things like if A then B, except that it's based on time being part of the elements of the primitives within the clauses. And another thing that makes the job easier, published standards, and by this I mean actual standards, which are ISO, International Standards Organization, not just a group that says, oh yeah, we have a standard, but you want a real standard. Dublin Core has been around for over 20 years and is, is used for almost everywhere for de describing assets. So my final comment on this presentation is that it's, uh, when we work on history, you find it's, it's not just building a server and a client and uh, playing around with numbers, it's really about people. So you're looking at the humanity and build, using knowledge-based technologies is much more suitable because that is what they're addressing. And as I said, way back at the beginning, history is about relationships. I'm doing, uh, I was originally doing a YouTube channel talking about combining this multidisciplinary approach to defining and managing knowledge. Uh, however, because of YouTube's recent policy change, I have to look for some other place to publish it. But uh, I find that uh, video at least allows many of this to be presented. Again, because of the use of advanced XR um, technologies like AR and VR, some of it you just have to experience as opposed to watching on a screen. But it's the 21st century, so it's, it's really time to do that. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic. Super, super interesting. And we've got some comments coming in the chat, so we're going to keep those for the panel conversation. So thank you very much, Julian. And I, I hand the presentation baton over to you, Shorpa. Thank you. And uh, I hope everything is audible and clear from here. And I'm going to share my screen right away. Visible for everyone? Perfect. Okay. So I'm Shilpa Karkira, the founder and CEO of Myra Technology, and I'm going to present to you Humanizing HR Tech with Neo4j. In this talk, I'm going to talk about the experiences of how the HR tech evolved uh, while we started using Neo4j. And uh, while we all know about the liberty and the you know liberty of actually using unstructured data and you know, uh, em embedding that into various applications comes into picture. I'm going to elaborate on various aspects so that you all can be aware of the kinds of applications that can come as, as well as the kind of designs or the kinds of ontology, ontology that you can use uh, while thinking about these kind of applications. So before we dive in, a little bit about me as well. Uh, I've been a hands-on developer from the very start, currently working as the CEO of Myra Technologies, which is a research company. Uh, passionate about tech, uh, work hands-on. I've been into electronics and uh, uh, software for quite some time. And I've written a book on uh, blockchains uh, with uh, Microsoft Azure and Springer Publications. So uh, that's about me and the company. Okay, so coming back to the topic. So coming to HR tech, the first step into HR tech would be, you know, the hiring aspect. And then we'll go on to different other aspects of HR tech. The first aspect is, you know, getting the right talent, getting the right job. And this is where the human aspect comes into picture. Currently, all of these uh, job engines you can find online are usually just powered with, you know, traditional databases, RDBs, uh, where, you know, you're just filtered by five categories. Really give me somebody with uh, Python skills uh, from some so-and-so university, and that's it. And it's so not human because uh, human is not just classified into these five categories and you can't just make a decision on that. And that's where usually the you know person, the hiring manager is actually looking into the resume. But uh, when we have like something like as a near 4 j or when we use a graph database, this person or this resume that we're looking into 
can be described and stored in the database as that person and not just filtering him out with those five categories of filters that we usually see on all of these job engines. So I'm going to elaborate that further and we'll see the transition of uh, you know the usage from the application point of view and the design point of view. So let's look at a resume. So you can see this resume out here. So what you can see here is that this person who is a bank accountant, he says he has excellent analysis and observation skills. But the sad part is our job engines or wherever you are applying most of the time, it's just going to weed out all of this. It's just going to take out what you're doing, which company you are at, what's the timeline. And most of the time, a lot of people just get filtered out you know majority uh, when when you get into such job engines or job application websites now when i look at near 4j and i i don't have to just structure a person with fixed tables and fixed number of attributes and that's where the dynamic aspect of near 4j comes into picture for us so what we did was that we went on the attributes that were associated with a person can be flexible, uh, can be accommodated ad hoc, and it could be based on you know, the kinds of jobs that are associated to that person as well. So that's where the dynamic modeling comes into picture. So let's understand more where this, uh, you know, why you know, Neo4j and why it made a fit for us. Um, I'm just going to share it from here. Yeah. So what what is the first thing is that the number of attributes that that's associated with one person is actually more than just the five to six filters that we see. The second one is uh, whenever you see like a lot of companies that are like associated that are famous that are branded are easily picked up when you apply as well. Like when you work at Microsoft, definitely your visibility is better. But today, like within the startup phase, uh, this era where a lot of companies are encouraged to come and work, the recognition of uh, job recommendation engines to accommodate more companies comes into action when you have, you know, uh, uh, things that can increase and uh, flexibly attach to uh, the graph database. Now, when I mean by increasing companies, it's not just the number of companies, the types of companies, the kinds of domains. Uh, probably there are certain companies that are fast paced, fast delivery companies, certain new kinds of companies like Airbnb. I mean, the kind of model that Airbnb had over the years, that's quite different from the other traditional kind of companies. So the attributes associated with different different kinds of companies also come into picture, research oriented companies, sales oriented companies. So the attributes tagged to these companies also come into picture. And that's also what is what could be easily accommodated into the draft database. Uh, third part is the skills. So when you talk about skills today and probably in the 1990s, uh, the skills evolve, right? So when you say somebody who's trained in Java or in certain language, today when you, what I would personally want when I look for someone is somebody who has a fast learning curve for different languages. I don't want somebody to be traditionally stuck with one language. And that could be my requirement as while hiring. And the same thing goes for the people who are applying as well you're not defined by the skills that are, you know, that are being filtered by the skills. And when you do a storage on a traditional database, you are just filtering by skills as well. So that's another factor. So are there skills that are similar, that are evolving, the kind of names of skills that are there, or certain skills that are connected to certain competencies that you see. So for example, somebody who is a fast learner uh, does not have to just write fast learner on his resume, but somebody who actually has a bigger grasp of a lot of other skills, a lot of other you know, coding languages, just indicates that he has the knack to learn a lot of languages in a short period of time. And that's where the comp competencies come into picture or the caliber comes into the picture. So that kind of consciousness of designing your graph database can come into picture because the flexibility is there. And now the next set of attributes, you know, about the Neo4j is going to be uh, elaborated here. So the 
main part is the ontology of the design schema is actually flexible. Now, when I talk about HR tech, the knowledge base, the metadata, the uh, data from different uh, candidates, all of this would make up a very different kind of a you know a set of rules to build the knowledge graph or to build the you know uh, database as well. Whereas in a tra traditional uh, you know system, it would have been create a table for companies, create a table for educations with the skills and you know that's very structured so the flexibility is key and we need to learn about how do we actually leverage the flexibility considering the attributes companies skill sets and competencies that we discussed the next next aspect is the dynamic uh, queries so we learned about one is the storage how you're going to store a lot of information how you're going to make use of these infinite attributes that you have and how do you store it now the second aspect is how do you query it and how do you pull it out and that's where the dynamic queries come into picture so you can that's what in a graph you know you can start from anywhere and you can you know pull out anything from anywhere so it's not like a sequence like a tree or a nested structure that you have to go through so i'm going to show some dynamic queries that we used and uh, we can see how we've made use uh, use out of it uh, one more thing that comes into picture is uh, the integration. So what we did uh, when we were using leveraging Neo4j was uh, using Elasticsearch on top of it. Now, when I say uh, like I work like somebody has worked in Samsung, for example, Samsung uh, Limited, Private Limited, or like somebody says Samsung Mobiles, the kind of uh, names of what somebody is saying when they work at certain places could be you know, matched with Elasticsearch and that flexibility is quite easy. So that's one example of integration. At the same time, uh, you have many other such integrations which you can attach on top of and you could, you could really query faster and make sense of it a lot faster as well. And the last part is lightweight because you can query it in, in, in an easier form in better methods of indexing if it's designed very well as well. So the designing is not constant across all industries. You can design it specific to the industry that you are working. And you, know, you can design the labels, the hierarchy, and the uh, kind of uh, you know, mechanisms based on the industry that you're working for. And in our case, it's the HR tech. So that's the reason why we chose this. We are going to see the use cases uh, moving forward. Um, I'm going to show you the process uh, from here. So what we did was uh, we took a parser. It parses out the resumes. I showed you all some of the resumes. Now the structure is like really changing for every person. Every person writes a resume very different. And uh, like with Neo4j, we have certain major labels which are there. And if they're not into that particular label, then you can create a new one and you can add it to a new segment of uh, the database. But what we did majorly is try to classify it and add it to the, to the labels as well. Now, what happens now if, if there's a resume that has uh, something like some new skill, like since the skills are evolving, 10 years back, certain skills probably might not have been there and which are there today. So then these kind of data sets come and get added onto the database and you could have some ambiguous data grouped as unknown or miscellaneous. Now what we did is we continuously started using clustering models to uh, classify this ambiguous data and keep attaching those labels on top of it as the data set evolved. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, if for example, Mm, let's take something like, uh, you know, research skills, which we talk about today. For example, a lot of researchers in the AI field would talk about, you know, uh, leveraging a lot of, you know, the algorithms that we use. So then the kind of uh, queries or the kind of uh, words that are associated with that domain 
would group them and then you could have a label associated on top of it while you cluster them. So similar kinds of people could be clustered together and then a label could be attached. So this was one background process that we kept doing. At the same time, we kept classifying into the labels that we had. So we had a good balance of structured labels, like the structured sets of data that we had. And whatever unstructured used to be there used to get classified or get clustered for creating indirect or uh, indirect inferences, so as to say. So for example, Myra, which really as a company might not be known to a lot of other people, but it's a research company. Now, uh, a recruiter might not know that, or a job engine might not directly know that unless tagged with it. Now, if somebody who has research skills joined Myra, somebody from somebody like uh, Google Research Labs, for example, join Myra, then it, it's actually associating that research mindset or the research terminology to a company as well. And that kind of indirect inferences can be created when you have this kind of a database. And that's what we're trying to leverage here. So that was uh, one of the things that we did. And that's where these dynamic queries came into picture. So somebody who is working in uh, an IT company, for example, who gives services, so, and uh, probably he is required to work in some other solution oriented company. Then, you know, that association with these companies that are similar could really be made because a lot of common factors or common profiles link between the two. And that's how the linkages are, you know, can be leveraged in this kind of a database. So that's what the process is. And uh, what we, how we leveraged in terms of, uh, uh, application was that we created a bot which could just uh, like answer any of your demands. So I could say, give me people who have high learning curves. Give me people who code a lot of languages. Give me people who can learn a lot of languages quite quickly. Give me people who have a really good communication skills. Now, when I say I want people with communication skills, it does not necessarily mean that the word communication skills is tagged with it. It could mean that somebody who has been an orator, who has done a lot of anchoring jobs are all connected in my query. And then that comes back to me. So that's what we created with uh, AMA. That's us Myra anything and we we gave back those kind of responses so that's one part and then uh, regarding artificial intelligence I mean which is obviously powered and interlinked here we kept clustering and we kept dynamically grouping people you know in terms of new kinds of patterns and trends so it's not limited to these five to six filters so that was another uh, continuous thing that we kept doing. Now, when, when AI comes to picture, it's not just that as well. It's not just about the data that uh, you, know, you get from your resumes, but it could be uh, the interviews that a person is giving or speaking about. It could be about uh, probably managerial reviews about a person. So all this unstructured data could actually make sense when you're able to extract that put it onto the database in an, in a flexible uh, you know ontology or a flexible system so as to say so that's what uh, the fourth attribute comes into it and the last one is quite important personally to me and to many many other people who are outliers who perform well and who don't have those branded labels onto them to have an unbiased review of their profiles, irrespective of the branded or the known uh, biases that come into picture. Like for example, a known company, a person from a known company just gets more traction when you look at his resume. But probably he's much more, you know, there are certain people who are much more skilled and they come from lesser known companies as well. So that agnostic behavior of querying out uh, different kinds of profiles comes into picture when you have this kind of a design that's set up to be you know, flexible, accommodating of larger set of parameters, and is able to, you know, you're able to retrieve that through a flexible query as well. So that's what uh, we are looking at in terms of the key components. So one is what all you can do with this kind of uh, uh, stack. And the second is what kind of design or mindset do you need to have to accommodate that in a graph database. 
because if you use the same design or the thought process that you use for relational databases, then you know that wouldn't make sense when you even use Neo4j. So that's the two key components. One is the awareness of the application and things that you can do, and the kind of design that you require uh, or the design uh, process that you require to build this kind of a database. So these are the key components that you require to keep in mind. Uh, I'm going to go to the uh, certain queries and talk about the process that we used uh, while you know going through these kind of queries. So this is not mandatory to you be used only for the hiring part. That's one more part that I would want to cover is that when you use uh, something like this, like, you know, it's not just for the hiring or the recruitment purpose, but it could also be the employees that is that are working in a large organization. You're not factored by the scores that a person has uh, achieved. Maybe it's about the talks that he's given inside the company or the impact that he's created inside the company. And it's not always tangible in terms of a performance score, for example. It could be the manager actually, uh, you know, giving a recommendation, writing certain things about what he's done or somebody, you know, with a lot of caliber, which could be bring or brought, or brought on to a different role. So it's also for, you know, improve, enhancing the employee um, identity inside a company. Uh, which could be, you know, uh, added with all the attributes that's associated with an employee's journey. So, for example, there's a long-term, uh, 15-year, you know, working, uh, a 15-year experienced person working in that company who spent his time over the years delivering and, you know, performing. And that person could be pretty suited to a role inside the company. That could be one application of it. Or another application where we could use this could be uh, somebody who is like fast paced. I mean, somebody who works and is able to take a lot of different roles and is able to grasp a lot. Now, when I say all this can be done, how it can be done is by associating the different kind of attributes, the different kind of you know nodes that are there and the kinds of relationships that are created. So that's what we're going to see here. So if you see a sales assistant with a uh, fairly, you know, this is something that's with uh, Oracle SQL development knowledge in the banking domain. So usually people in sales are not somebody who would just have this kind of an, it's usually tagged with the IT domain. But now this kind of a combination is still very flexible and it's easy to query compared to a conventional one. And that's what you can see is, is being leveraged. And the second one is okay. It's in, it's in the banking domain, so uh, you know that's that's marked in terms of the domain that they're working and the role that they're working here. So that's one way. But when you have an elastic search, for example, or you're having certain roles that are not sales assistant but they're similar to this word, then you could even have indirect queries, which just goes and brings all the similar similar roles that are associated with sales assistant and that are brought into picture and it gives you a deeper search so as to say to get back uh, with a better result so that's what uh, you know this kind of a query gives us so that's what i'm going to run some of these queries here uh, while we see the outcomes before that let's just have a look at the panel to know the basic design and the basic uh, you know things that we've added here i've definitely like simplified it for the purpose of the talk and uh, there's a lot that we could do uh, further to this as well. So what we've done here is we have uh, stored uh, this with certain labels, certain key things for now. That would be professional skills that is stored here. You could see uh, the various kind of scores. So we are taking the competency scores and different kinds of scores as well. Um, there could be uh, different organizations so and the different kinds of skills that are there so that could go on and you could associate the skills with different kinds of tools uh the level of tools so is it a main tool is it a sub tool is it uh something that's associated with the tool so all of that is being added here and uh, there's a knowledge base uh, you know meta that's built separately that's not coming out from the resumes but 
it's just helping us uh, build relations and linkages for deeper uh, searches. So that's what uh, we have set this database with uh, at this point. The next one is when we go and associate, we can say that give me people with so-and-so skills. I can pull the uh, things out. I can explore what uh, kind of people are associated to it. And you know that, that kind of a search and that kind of flexibility gives a more exploratory uh, you know, uh, capability for even a recruiter, for even a hiring manager to explore what kind of combination of person that the person wants to work with as well. So it's not just for a tool or for a bot, but also for the mindset that's very enabling, which is not very structured in time in terms of the you know database as well. So you know because. You might not know that there's a company that would have certain researchers as well. And somebody has done something very similar to what exactly you want. And that's what you know we are trying to unlock here as well. So somebody with four years experience of research associate uh, who's worked or studied at National Institute. So this kind of combination, it could just pull out a lot of people or pull out a lot of similar profiles and uh, give us that uh, capability to make more dynamic demands as, as a user than you know, being limited to a limited set of fields that we usually search for as well. So that's, that's what uh, the gist of it is. Uh, one more thing that uh, you know, was one of the uh, very happy responses from the people that use the application was that uh, you know, if you usually have somebody that you really were, like working with, Probably could be your colleague or your manager or uh, you know some other employee. You want to say, I want to work with someone like that, or get me a manager who is exactly as good as this guy, or somebody who is so uh, proactive. And when you say this in in general words, you want your graph database or you want your tech to actually be able to go and get a similar profile of a person. Uh, who has all of these qualities. Now, that might not come from a resume, that might come from his work styles or the kind of roles that he picked up that made him you know, be an excellent manager, for example. So that kind of capabilities come into picture when you have that kind of flexible dynamic queries that you can run across here as well. So like probably uh, somebody who has traveled the world and has actually had that maturity of understanding different cultures would actually make a great manager probably. That could be easily queried by, by just saying, give me or a person who's traveled to or worked in seven different countries as well. So that's, that's a simple translation of a demand or an application idea to the query that you can actually use. And that's what I think is the, you know, is the connection between what we're doing here and how you can leverage it in terms of real life application as well. So that is uh, the part of it. I'm going to run certain queries so that we can see it ourselves and make sense of it. Run this. So there's Ravi Kumar. Just give me a little triangle. Throat one second. Yes. So we have a candidate here on the screen, and uh, he uh, is that sales assistant with, uh, you know, worked with a bank, with, uh, you know, a, a location with all these, all of these skills. So that's about like this. But now, for example, we want to make an inference about some people who play cricket and have a very data oriented way of working that correlation or that correlation with certain unknown parameters which were never used while you you know working with traditional job engines could always come into picture while using this kind of a database so somebody who plays a certain sport could actually have those life skills of using it in his work and that's quite common we all know that but how much of us how how many of us have seen a lot of job engines using that. And that's the kind of neuroscience or the kind of thought process that's required 
by us, you know, by us technologists, while we design the database as well, so that these applications that we really want uh, to work on a more human level than by just filtering it by few parameters, so as to say. So that's what we are looking at. So let's look at some very uh, common way of querying. I'm going to the most common way of querying something that could be uh, give me uh, give me a manager with good supervising skills, I would say. Now here, see this this method of saying give me a supervision score of five. This is what we would do even in a relational database. I'm running it so that we can see what additionally we can do with Neo4j. So now I've pulled out people who have supervision scores greater than five. Now, if it was just about this, then I could use a traditional database, right? And, and that's it, because if it's just about as simple as querying this. But now let me see the different kinds of scores that are there. And let's see what kind of sense can we can we make out of it. So there are different kinds of attributes associated with this node. This node is for the scores of a particular candidate. Now, when we see, I can see the communication, uh, conflict resolution, and different ratings of uh, performance and stuff. Now, when I want to make a, a joint uh, query, like a, a query where I want to say, I want a combination of things with this person who has worked in very uh, old technologies, very new technologies, has managed a lot of new technologies and, you know, uh, has a supervision score. Then I can go and see that what all skills uh, are associated with this person, you know, the range of skills. At the same time, I can see that the scores are also, you know, in, in line with my basic requirement. So the structured thing that I required, as well as the unstructured inference that I want to pull out from the data is what I can pull out from here as well. So uh, as, as I al al already said as well, that for example, if he's worked in uh, a company that is across different uh, countries or locations, and probably if he has had a lot of transfers, I could probably associate, okay, this person's open to travel, he's worked well in different other locations, and that's where I can use this. So that's com that combination is what I can leverage here in, in, in comparison to the traditional database. So that's uh, about uh, how we can leverage and how what we can do. And uh, probably like if there are two companies, like you can say Axis and this uh, small finance bank. And these two companies probably are uh, ha having a work culture. We can have another label called work culture that has a very traditional work culture, for example. So that label could be tagged as work culture and you can tag it there. And you can get companies that are very traditional and then you can see that a person can fit into this as well. So that's the kind of power that we can leverage here with this kind of uh, you know infrastructure and uh, we can leverage that uh, to build an application that's more human and uh, more people oriented than just the limitations of technology that you know we are bound to uh, because you know while designing as technologists as well so that's that's what my focus has been about to talk and that's what i think can make a difference when you we all try to build technology as well so the design thinking the way a schema has to be built and how do we uh, package it such that it enables that kind of flexibility for the end user to access and uh, you know uh, leverage it to you know a much more human ground as well so from there uh, to a lot of careers to change in terms of the flexibility of technology wish you all the best and uh, i hope we all leverage technology better to amazing designs to amazing uh, applications and uh, see a lot, lot of awesome things happen in the community uh, together as well. That's it for me. Uh, look forward to the questions and happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was also uh, uh, followed by an, another excellent talk. So an excellent talk followed by another excellent talk. My goodness, I, I, I've got a lot of questions. Uh, Nathan's got a lot of questions. I think Julian's got a lot of questions as well. <laughs> I saw some note taking going on in the background. Um, 
I guess, so you're all on mute, so you might want to unmute yourselves. Uh, I guess let's start with start with you, Julian. So that was really, really interesting sort of understanding about how you're using, you know, how you're visualising graphs. In fact, that you're, what you're trying to do is you're, you're visualising stories and, and how you're bringing these different things together. And I guess that, that I'm probably jumping all the way to like a, to a next steps thing, but we, we, we've seen these 3D rendering going on on a 2D screen. So have you been experimenting with um, sort of using the augmented reality or the, the, the various visors and things? So I apologize, I've probably gonna jump right to end. Of... <laughs> oh yeah. And then, of course, one of the ramifications of the, uh, of the pandemic is that, um, you know, meetups used to be a thing. Just in here in Silicon Valley, there were always many meetups on any given night, and you had to pick which one. The thing about a meetup is that you could actually experience it. Any kind of XR tech you pick is a subjective experience. You cannot talk about it, and you cannot put it on a flat screen. You have to do it. So that's been seriously derailed by the pandemic, but it is absolutely an essential part of the overall effort. Absolutely. I had a question for Shilpa. Um, how d would a system like this help companies achieve their diversity and equity and inclusion goals? I, I know that's an important thing for a lot of companies these days when they talk about DE and I, and especially when I say, "Give me somebody who's like uh, somebody who I've worked with who I've liked." Um, it seems yeah. like that is lending a lot of the same kinds of people and maybe not such a diverse workforce. So, how could how could Neo4j help us? Um, find different kinds of candidates maybe than we thought who are still able to perform the work. Yes. So that's the, the key is that one, adding a lot of other attributes than what we commonly take from a resume. Like usually when you write where you worked, there are certain more lines below it that we usually write, but actually nobody, you know, computes them. People read it, maybe, maybe not, but it's usually read it out. So now when we build a system, we can take those additional lines and really add them into the graph database, right? So that's one small thing that we do. Second is uh, caliber-based, right? Caliber-based hiring. So caliber is like, okay, there are a lot of girls, a lot of women as well, who have had different kinds of experience in a lot of female-oriented domains. And there are a lot of men who are, because of the history of, you know, you know, really of the, you know, cliches that were going around. But now we as hiring managers or we as people responsible could actually say that these are the caliber that they have because they are you know, having certain high learning curves or fast learning capabilities, let's take that risk and use these people for a different role. So that kind of recommendation can come into picture very easily. So for example, who is uh, very good at speaking could be uh, really do detail oriented while even documenting a technical uh, book probably, right? So. Uh, an anchor who might not know about tech, but she might know that how it has to be put across to people so that people can understand something very complicated. So that kind of diversity of different skills keep being you know, interrelated to a different work requirement can be connected with Neo4j when you have caliber as the associated factor. So this caliber could be a, a node in itself, which could just add, you know, these kind of you know, linkages there and give us that in the recommendation engine. So that's what I think are the two things that are coming to picture and that helps us to do that for increasing of diversity uh, and inclusion of different kinds of people for different kinds of jobs. That's really interesting. Thanks. Mm, absolutely. Um, I guess coming coming back to the um, sort of history as a graph database. So you you talked about having two hundred and fifty five different databases and not having a standardised enterprise data dictionary. So the fact that you could have the same term having different meanings and things like that it would be really interesting to know what process did you go through to for the pardon the pun, normalize those 255 different data models that you were working with to get something that's going to work with the graph. How, how were you tackling those challenges where you didn't, where you had inconsistent language being used for terminology? 
Well, you know, in an enterprise, you can't go to every department and tell them, I know what you've been doing for the last 30 years, and now you have to do it this way. So instead, L3D was uh, developed as a collaborative effort. So we went to all the different divisions and departments of Lego and uh, got a sense of what kind of terminology, well, what kind of taxonomy we could have. And then along with L3D, there was a taxonomy, and then it was left up to each department to figure out, oh yeah, when those Darwin guys say this, then this is what we call that. And in that way, it be, uh, became something that could propagate by itself outwards without offending any particular histories. So it's, it's almost like setting up a canonical data model or something like that, where you, you've sort of said, you keep the you keep the data structure, you keep the models that you have now, but could you please transform the things that we need into this shape? Is that sort of a fair? Uh, no, because L3D was starting over. Uh, you know, all of the existing databases were doing, had been doing their own thing for many years. And the, the premise of L3D was that it was 3D graphics. So it, it was complete starting over. And at that point, that's when I could say, well, element means this, or whatever, pick a term. In, in Darwin terms or L3D terms, it means this exact thing. And then as each department came along to look at it, say, oh yeah, the Darwin guys call it this, but we call it that. And so we had that luxury of being able to go from an ab initio point instead of having to try and map all these different things in, into a sensible, something sensible. Yeah. Absolutely. Very, very cool. Julian, one of the things you mentioned was the Dublin core, and I'm not really familiar with that. Could you give me like a kindergarten version of, of what that is? Uh, so it was an effort about 25 years ago, a bunch of people in library science and, catalog and j just uh, any particular um, discipline you can think of which has to catalog assets. And a great example is art. And in fact, one of the primary motivators of uh, the Dublin Core was the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Think about, think about an asset, right? It's got, probably got a title, it's got its creator or a set of creators, the dates of creation. And so at the Dublin effort, which was called that because they met in a city named Dublin, uh, Dublin, Ohio, to be specific, they came up with the basic set of attributes which must be this implemented for any particular asset. And then whatever science there was adopted Dublin Core as their starting point. But then as you branch out, it turns out that it actually wasn't enough for the Getty Museum. So they came up with another one called Categories for Descriptions of Works of Art because there were some things that it came up with art that weren't necessarily applicable generally, right? Things like a title and creators, that's, that's absolutely universal. But uh, things like, well, this painting was acrylic on canvas or this painting was watercolors on glass and stuff like that doesn't apply when you're trying to describe a book. It has, just has no meaning. So that meant that each discipline needed to start with Dublin Core that way you can count on it being around everywhere. And then as you go and teach discipline, then they have their particular domain specific standard. Oh, that's really cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Uh, sure, but something that sort of jumped up at me, I thought was fascinating. And I don't know, is this something that you're uh, doing or, or planning to do? Was you're yeah. getting this huge amount of rich data. So you're getting information about candidates, you're getting information about what technologies they're working on, presumably information about a specific platform or, or a thing that they're doing as well. And it struck me, you get, you're get potentially getting a lot of data in here, which you're automating to, to pass and split out and do the inference and all that good stuff. Is there an opportunity to get a view of what are popular technology or technology combinations or technology with industry combinations or all of this kind of thing where you can start to paint a picture of trends over time as, as to what's happening yes for sure so i think uh it's a combination of uh you know having the database that's that's the base component where we are you know storing everything but the real intelligence of you know structuring it throughout is through our machine learning classifiers on top of it that keep classifying them, that keep grouping them or clustering them. So, so as to say that, you know, a lot of neural networks that keep running in background, they don't really service us directly, but they keep clustering it inside the database so that it can dynamically keep adding uh, new relationships, new, you know, labels on top of it to make sense of it continuously. So that's one. And uh, we just, we've been just sticking to base technologies because you've asked about 
technologies, we purely been doing this in Python, uh, uh, pulling out data like in millions and millions of data across different kinds. And uh, we're just associating them from scratch because if you bulk up a lot of technology on top of each other, it just makes it like, you know, uh, lost in the design. So we've stuck to the basic fundamentals of you know, A4J, Elasticsearch, if it's required to just, uh, uh, you know, quick search, partial search and stuff. And uh, a lot of Python, which is actually designing our uh, neural networks and the classifiers for particular things of uh, creating these labels dynamically as well. So that's all that we're doing. And um, yeah, like if things go well, we want to make this uh, open crowdsource thing. That's the vision as a community, because getting better jobs we all deserve. And that's a dream like as a technologist that I want to do. So I'm, I'm sure like not today, but we would want to do that to open this out so that we all can make sure that we all have satisfying jobs and really i think with with support of neo4j i, I think we surely can open this out as well as an open database as well so uh, yeah i think i think that's that's what uh, uh, would be the answer to the set of you know vision and we've already built a large part of this we look forward to build it in a way that we can crowdsource and open this for a large purpose and a large number of people to leverage this for better jobs and better quality of hr processes as well that sounds very very cool you know one of the questions probably along those same lines is um keeping track of companies as they have mergers and acquisitions and different subsidiaries that get spun off. Are you using the same types of ways to keep track of that? Um, or or yeah. do you have feeds of information that keep track of who's who's who in the corporate world? Yeah, so continuous news feeds and everything is every day evaluated, like from the stock market prices to the news feeds to whatever you find online is continuously being uh, parsed through and they're being associated every day. So that's what it's quite bulky uh, to show it across right away. But that's what like every data that we are able to get with any company that's already in a database as well uh, keeps associating with the news that is coming. So for example, the merger and acquisition, that's getting updated every day. So we have daily crawlers, we daily you know, feeds of information that keeps updating the graph database daily. So that makes it, yeah, that's quite important. Yeah, wow. and the kind of different names as well, so yeah as well, the aliases as well. So there's a label called aliases and it just uh, adds all the aliases of different ways of the company that's called as well. Certain people just put, use the short form of a company and certain people have. So all of this is being uh, added on to it as well. Yes. You're saying uh, amazing, yes. Oh, that's great. Thank you. That's really cool. I think the other bit that I found really interesting was sorry were you gonna ask a question julian's was i oh no sorry i thought, I thought you raised your hand um yeah i had a question for <laughs> oh Shelby. please go for it go for it uh since you're dealing with these more humanistic i mean conventional database systems like this keyword match that keyword match and you know and you mm -hmm. uh, sound like you are approaching a more humanistic way of finding people and matching them to things i'm wondering if you're incorporating fuzzy logic into your attribute searches also Yes, definitely. So over this, then we are having our own layers of Python where we are using uh, a neural network that creates a better recommendation of, uh, you know, the kind of roles. So if it, the person is asking for a person that's uh, probably very quick uh, in terms of service delivery, for example, then uh, that, that kind of recommendation is matched on, on the layer. But the problem with uh, you know, a neural network sitting on a traditional databases, it's not evolving, it's not updating, it's not you know, dynamic. So that's why we chose to use Neo4j because the querying part is also dynamic and our recommendations are getting better day by day. And if our recommendation has misfired, for example, uh, to uh, an HR, uh, we are taking that as a feedback and we're storing it in the database uh, as, as a negative. So next time when you query, the query is also penalized in, in the graph database as well. So it doesn't give, like the score is penalized for that person as well when it's failing as well. 
So we've kept a loop of the fuzzy logic in between that we use Python in, and we're storing the feedbacks again onto the graph database. So next time when you pull that out, the same person might not get the same recommendation when the person has rejected that person as well. So that's why it's called, it's evolving. And yeah, that's why the fuzzy logic is there, but the feedback and storing the inference for that person is also what is crucial here. And uh, yes, that's what we've done. And uh, yeah, one more thing that came into my mind, we've used Rasa and Spacey and customized the Rasa neural network as well. So that does a lot of uh, good uh, you know, analysis for us in terms of NLP. When somebody's saying, I want someone like this, because as, as Nathan, you indicated earlier. So that, that part is done by Rasa in, in between, which is doing that as well. That's very cool. Thank you. Very, very cool. Uh, the bit that I found super, super exciting as well was this idea of being able to infer what a company does. And that is really powerful if you're a small company or even if you're working for a big company, sort of understanding that yes you're working in a big company and whilst the big company's role might be i don't know it's a logistics company it's a huge logistics company but if you area of that or you're working in a specific id area of that or what have you uh that area of you you've got some kind of linking there of those skills and the fact that you can now start to say well actually these candidates who you didn't consider before actually you probably should because whilst you look at the company, you go, I have no idea that who that company is because it's tiny or, but surely this logistics company surely doesn't do anything along, along these lines. I find it really fascinating how you can now start to, you can almost actively suggest candidates and say, well, have you thought about these candidates? And I think that is super cool. Yes, yes, definitely. And this is where the relationships come into picture. So the relationship of a role, like a CTO in a banking company and a CTO in a tech company, for example, the score of this relationship might be different when for a particular role. Like if somebody is searching a CTO for a tech company versus a CTO in a banking company, that's a very different thing, right? And that kind of relationships could have the score as an attribute and that could be checked while querying it out. So that's also... Yes. So that that would be uh, uh, that was some these were like all fascinating even for us when we you know went ahead and tried this on our end as well. No, brilliant, brilliant. That's yeah, really cool. So, Julian, if we want to follow your work, oh, you you said that there'll be videos coming forward, um, potentially not on YouTube but on, on a different avenue. I'm just. Uh, I'm excited to see how this uh, visualizations evolve. So, um, is it can we find you on LinkedIn or wh where's the best place for us to keep up with you so we can um, keep track of, of where this goes forward? Um, I think the whatever video channel I'm doing, and you'll find it on associated websites. For example, the JPL effort is at jplgraphicslab.org. Okay. Uh, the SIGGRAPH, you know, SIGGRAPH is a formal professional organization, so they won't be publicizing any of this until it's much closer to being publicly accessible. And then the uh, LEGO effort is at legodigital.org. Great. And yeah, I'm on LinkedIn and, and most of the social networks. So. Thanks. Brilliant, and thank you very much. A huge, huge thank you to both you, Dr. Julian Gomez, and to you, Shilpa Kakara. Thank you so much for those brilliant, brilliant presentations. Thank you once again, Nathan, for joining for joining as co-host. Wow. Always amazing. It, it's brilliant. And yeah, thank you so much for brilliant content. Thank you very much again for everybody joining in. And take care. Have a wonderful day. Yeah. Bye. Right, glad to do it. Glad thank to do you. it. Bye. Pleasure. Thank you.